the great Irish railway share crash of the 1850s, the wonderful English economist John Stuart Mill observed that the crisis doesn't destroy wealth. It merely evidences the extent to which wealth has already been destroyed by stupid investments made in the boom. So banking crises, they don't start the day the market collapses, but they actually begin years before when the banks begin to borrow and lend recklessly, using other people's money to ramp up asset values. So what have we learned from the 2008 banking crisis? Lesson one, the easiest way to rob a bank is to run it. In the old days, the image of the bank robber was the guy in the balaclava on the outside breaking in. These days, it's the guy in the suit on the inside breaking out. Banks are now destroyed from the inside out. Lesson two. Once speculation using other people's money becomes the fastest way to get rich, the bank's chief executive becomes the biggest threat to the bank and the system. Because if the CEO's pay is linked to the share price, then we are almost guaranteed to get wholesale looting as the CEOs take these reckless gambles to drive up the share price to pay themselves. I mean, why wouldn't they push it to the limit? Because it's entirely in their interest to do so. Lesson three. Now let's think about JP Morgan, a man who'd seen his fair share of these crises come and go. He said something brilliant. He said, nothing so undermines your financial judgment as the sight of your neighbor getting rich. Now this is exactly what happens in a boom. Everybody sees the guy down the road or in the bank across the road doing well, getting rich, and we try to copy them. And this is how a mania takes hold. Now don't get me wrong. I'm not saying bankers are bad people. They're just humans. And humans, we're all totally irrational. And when things are going well, we all tend to follow the herd. And chief executives of banks are no different. Lesson four, the forest fire. The best way to think of a banking crisis which is getting out of control is to consider a forest fire. The bankers are the pyromaniacs who have actually started the fire. The central bankers and the regulators, they're like the firemen, but unfortunately they were looking the other way. Now the rest of the forest that hasn't burned yet is the general economy, which is threatened with incineration. Finally, the politicians are the last line of defense, and they are the ones who've got to put the fire out at all costs, with all means. Lesson five, the kidnapper wears Prada. Once we are in the situation that we found ourselves in in 2008, it becomes like a hostage drama. The bankers are the kidnappers, the economy is the hostage, and the bankers threaten the politicians that if they don't get bailed out with as much money as they need, then they will shoot the hostage, the economy, and the entire thing will implode. So then the issue is really over how much ransom is paid over, and the ransom is always other people's money, usually taxpayers. So the banker picks up the phone to the politician and says, If you don't give us what we want, we will kill the economy. And you don't want that to happen, do you? So come on now, pay up and nobody's going to get hurt. So this is really the too big to fail mantra in action. And this is how the public gets put on the hook for debts that the public had nothing to do with in the first place. So the question now is, could this all happen again? I mean, surely you'd think to yourself, after a crisis of this magnitude, there must be all classes of systems put in place to prevent a repeat of this type of cycle. Well, don't be so sure. For example, the mantra now is that we don't need aggressive financial regulation. What we simply need is an increase in capital requirements. But this is not actually true because bank capital is only an accounting residual. It's assets minus liabilities equals capital. There is no banking leprechaun with a pot of gold labelled capital at the end of the financial rainbow. So if the lads on the inside want to inflate assets and understate liabilities, they can actually create bank capital. So we're back to square one. 
And this is why we need more, not less, regulation. Because when a bank collapses, so too does the balance sheet of a country. And this leads to a liquidity trap where punters have too much debt and they don't want to borrow. And the banks have still too much bad debt and they don't want to lend. And the economy gets stuck, gets stuck, gets, gets, gets stuck. And it shrinks and prices start to fall. Now, forcing austerity, which has been the reaction thus far on such a country, which is already suffering from deleveraging and deflation, is a bit like putting an anorexic on a diet and expecting that person to get fat. If you doubt us, look at Europe right now. The banks are still weak, deficits enormous, unemployment in double digits, and prices are falling. And the Italian central bank boss, Draghi, is doing his best to turn the euro into the lira behind the backs of the Germans. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is hardly a solution. Run, ever, run, ever, run.